The ground is speaking again beneath Mount St. Helens, and the language is one of vibration, fracture, and shifting pressure. The iconic stratovolcano, infamous for its catastrophic eruption in May of 1980, is now rattling with a swarm of earthquakes in the aftermath of a magnitude 7.8 event that struck the broader tectonic environment. The timing is no coincidence. Whenever the Earth's crust convulses with such immense force, it alters the stress fields that lace through fault zones, subduction interfaces and volcanic conduits. What we are witnessing is not random shaking, but rather a chain reaction of geological processes intimately tied to how magma, fluids and crustal stresses interact beneath the Pacific Northwest. One must ask, why does a single colossal quake sometimes trigger distant volcanic responses, while other times the subsurface remains quiet? Why now? And why here at this restless volcano? To answer this requires peeling back the layers of tectonic dynamics, understanding the specific architecture of Mount St. Helens's magmatic system, and examining how seismic waves can set entire underground reservoirs and faults into motion. The magnitude 7.8 earthquake released energy equivalent to hundreds of nuclear detonations, radiating seismic waves outward in all directions. These waves, both body waves traveling through the Earth's interior and surface waves rolling along its skin, propagate stress far beyond the rupture zone. As they pass through regions of crust already close to mechanical or magmatic instability, they can tip the balance. Mount St. Helens sits atop the Cascadia subduction zone, a tectonic environment where the oceanic Juan de Fuca plate dives beneath the North American plate at a rate of about 4 centimeters per year. This subduction drives water-rich sediments downward, releasing fluids that lower the melting point of the overlying mantle wedge, generating magma. That magma rises, stalls, and accumulates in complex reservoirs beneath the volcano. This is a system perpetually pressurized, always close to rearrangement, and sensitive to external stress triggers. In the hours and days following the large quake, instruments detected swarms of small to moderate earthquakes beneath and around Mount St. Helens. These are not surface-level fractures, but deeper responses tied to both brittle fault movement and magmatic pressurization. Seismic swarms at volcanoes typically differ from standard tectonic quakes. Instead of single large ruptures releasing energy, they consist of numerous smaller quakes clustered in space and time, reflecting fluids or magma migrating through cracks, forcing rock apart, or adjusting to shifts in the stress field. The question is whether these swarms represent the magma body being stirred, new intrusions from deeper mantle sources, or crustal accommodation of stress imparted by the remote earthquake. When seismic waves from the 7.8 event reach the Cascades, they impose transient dynamic stresses on faults and fractures beneath Mount St. Helens. Even stresses measuring just a fraction of a megapascal can significantly alter conditions in a system already near failure. The brittle crust around the volcano contains faults locked with strain, and beneath lies a partially molten body with volatiles that respond to changes in pressure. The passing waves could have unclamped faults, allowing them to slip in bursts of microseismicity. They could also have jostled the magma system, disturbing bubbles within the melt, changing buoyancy conditions, and perhaps even mobilizing pockets of magma or superheated fluids. The result? A rapid onset of earthquake swarms that are effectively the volcano's response to a tectonic nudge. One must consider also the concept of static stress changes. Large earthquakes permanently alter the stress distribution in the crust, either loading or unloading nearby faults and magmatic systems. Depending on the geometry of the quake and its rupture orientation, stresses at Mount St. Helens could have been increased in a way that promotes small-scale faulting or magma movement. Even though the main shock occurred some distance away, the redistribution of forces does not respect surface boundaries. Stress lines curve and bend through the crust, sometimes focusing at volcanic centers where the mechanical properties differ from surrounding rock. Magma chambers are not rigid spheres, but mushy zones of partially molten rock that transmit and amplify stress differently. Thus, the static and dynamic effects of the large quake converge on the volcano, producing the swarm we now observe.
Geophysicists studying the swarm note that its depth distribution is key. Many of the quakes occur several kilometers below the surface in the range of three to seven kilometers, coinciding with known storage zones of magma and hydrothermal fluids. This is not shallow surface cracking from landslides or collapse, but rather activity deep within the plumbing system. Some quakes are deeper still, perhaps tracing pathways where fresh mantle-derived magma is ascending. Each cluster and its migration pattern tell a story. Is magma intruding? Is pressure redistributing? Or are volatiles being exsolved? Careful analysis of the seismic waveforms reveals whether the signals are sharp, brittle failures or more emergent long-period events associated with fluid resonance. Early reports suggest a mixture of both, implying simultaneous brittle adjustment and magmatic mobilization. The physical mechanisms at play here tie into the larger context of subduction-driven volcanism. The Cascadia system is an ongoing experiment in crustal deformation, where massive amounts of strain build up between locked subduction zones and are occasionally released in earthquakes, slow slip events and volcanic eruptions. Mount St. Helens is unique among the Cascade peaks in that it has erupted frequently in the past century, most notably in 1980, but also with dome-building episodes extending into the 2000s. Its magma is more volatile, rich and eruptible compared to its neighbours, meaning the threshold for unrest can be lower. If the 7.8 earthquake provided even a small additional push, it may have been sufficient to destabilize certain zones of the magma plumbing system, resulting in swarms. Another geological mechanism to consider is the triggering of hydrothermal systems. Mount St. Helens harbors an active hydrothermal circulation of water, steam and gas that percolates through fractures and permeable zones. Dynamic stresses from seismic waves can increase pore pressure, force fluids into new cracks and trigger secondary quakes. Fluid movement can also weaken rock, allowing further seismicity. In some volcanic crises, hydrothermal pressurization alone without new magma produces swarms that mimic early eruptive signals. Disentangling whether the current swarm is magmatic or hydrothermal in origin requires dense seismic monitoring, gas emission studies, and ground deformation measurements. Instruments must detect whether the ground surface is inflating, suggesting magma intrusion, or whether the seismicity remains more diffused, hinting at fluid adjustments. Even the geometry of Mount St. Helens magma chamber makes it prone to triggered responses. Imaging studies suggest a vertically stacked system, with a deeper zone of partial melt feeding smaller, shallower reservoirs. Connections between these reservoirs can act like valves. If a quake perturbs one, it can cascade through the rest. Imagine shaking a container of carbonated liquid, bubbles nucleate, pressure redistributes, and the fluid becomes more mobile. The 7.8 quake may have been the shake that loosened conditions within the volcano's subsurface. As the swarm continues, seismologists watch carefully for changes in frequency, magnitude, and depth. A swarm that migrates upward over time is particularly concerning, as it may signal magma moving toward the surface. So far, reports suggest most activity remains at mid-crustal depths, but the system is dynamic. The swarm may fade as stresses relax, or it may evolve into a longer-term intrusion. What matters is that the large tectonic earthquake has highlighted once again how connected the planet's systems are. A rupture far away can awaken volcanic centers, revealing the delicate balance of forces always at play. The central investigative question remains, is Mount St. Helens simply groaning in adjustment to tectonic stress, or is this the early stage of a magmatic reawakening? The evidence lies in subtle details of seismic waveforms, deformation patterns and gas chemistry, all of which are being monitored with urgency. What we can say is that the swarm is a geological mechanism in action, a window into the interplay of stress, magma and fluids beneath one of the world's most studied volcanoes. If the 7.8 earthquake provided the initial jolt, the ongoing swarm at Mount St. Helens can be seen as the after-effect of a system attempting to re-equilibrate. The Earth's crust is not static rock, but a dynamic mosaic of stresses, fractures, melts and fluids. Each tectonic adjustment redistributes forces, and volcanoes respond in ways that reflect the architecture of their subsurface. For Mount St. Helens, that architecture is neither simple nor uniform. 
Beneath its scarred summit lies a stratified magmatic system with zones of crystal-rich mush, volatile charged melts, and hydrothermal circulation networks that all respond differently to stress. Seismologists often describe the crust beneath Mount St. Helens as a sponge riddled with partially molten pockets. These melt-rich domains are not fully liquid chambers, but mixtures of crystals, melt and volatiles that remain on the edge of mobilization. A large tectonic earthquake can inject enough energy to destabilize this equilibrium. The shaking induces shear within the mush, reactivates fractures and redistributes fluids. Each microquake in the swarm may correspond to a crack opening, a slip on a minor fault, or a bubble-driven adjustment in the magmatic reservoir. Taken together, they reveal that the subsurface is restless, shifting toward a new balance. One of the most telling aspects of the swarm is its clustering in bursts. Rather than a steady random distribution of quakes, the seismicity often accelerates and then wanes. This pattern is consistent with fluids being forced through cracks in pulses, each burst increasing permeability until pressure is relieved. Then, as pathways close or pressures equalize, the swarm quiets temporarily. Such cyclic behavior is a hallmark of magmatic or hydrothermal forcing rather than purely tectonic aftershocks. The 7.8 quake may have provided the initial push, but the subsequent oscillations are being sustained internally by magma and volatile dynamics. To fully appreciate the mechanism, one must consider the pressure-temperature relationships in subduction-related magmas. The magma beneath Mount St. Helens is rich in dissolved water and carbon dioxide delivered from the subducting oceanic plate. At depth, these volatiles remain dissolved due to confining pressure. But as pressure fluctuates, whether from tectonic shaking or local fault adjustments, volatiles can exsolve, forming bubbles. Bubble formation drastically changes magma behavior. It reduces density, increases buoyancy, and raises internal pressure. This positive feedback can accelerate magma movement. Even if no eruption follows, the swarm of quakes is the signature of this bubbling, pressurizing process. Another mechanism in play is resonance. Seismic waves from the 7.8 quake did not simply pass once. Their energy reverberated through the crust, setting up oscillations. If these oscillations coincided with the natural resonance of magma-filled cracks or fluid-filled conduits, they could amplify motion much like a struck tuning fork. This resonance effect could explain why the swarm intensified rapidly after the main shock. Laboratory experiments on fluid-saturated cracks confirm that even small dynamic stresses can mobilize fluids if resonance is triggered. In volcanic settings, this becomes a powerful driver of seismic swarms. Geodetic instruments, particularly GPS arrays and INSAR satellite imagery, are now being scrutinized to detect whether the ground surface is deforming. Inflation around Mount St. Helens would confirm that magma is moving upward. Even millimeters of uplift can be significant as they represent thousands of cubic meters of subsurface volume change. If no inflation is observed, the swarm may remain attributed to pressurized hydrothermal fluids rather than new magma ascent. However, the absence of deformation does not entirely exclude magma involvement, especially if the volume change is confined to deeper reservoirs. The swarm also brings into focus the long-term role of stress transfer between tectonics and volcanism. The Cascadia subduction zone is locked, accumulating immense strain that will eventually release in a megathrust event, potentially exceeding magnitude 9. Every moderate to large quake along the Pacific margin perturbs this system. Mount St. Helens, situated directly above the subducted slab, acts as a barometer of these stress changes. Swarms like the current one may be viewed not just as isolated volcanic unrest, but as indicators of how the subduction interface is evolving. Each tremor tells scientists about the degree of coupling, the depth of fluid release, and the pathways that connect mantle melt to crustal magma storage. It is also important to contrast Mount St. Helens with its neighbouring volcanoes. Mount Adams and Mount Hood, for example, have not shown similar swarm activity in the same time window, despite being subjected to the same seismic waves. This highlights the uniqueness of Mount St. Helens' subsurface system. Its reservoirs are closer to critical thresholds, its conduits more responsive, its volatile content higher. 
It underscores that volcanic triggering is highly selective, dependent not just on the external quake, but on the internal state of each volcano. Looking ahead, several scenarios remain possible. The most likely outcome is that the swarm gradually diminishes as stresses relax, and fluids find new equilibrium pathways. This would mirror past episodes where Mount St. Helens quaked restlessly, without leading to eruption. Another possibility is that the swarm marks the opening of new fractures that may later serve as conduits for magma ascent, setting the stage for unrest months or years down the line. The less common but still plausible scenario is that the swarm escalates, with earthquakes migrating upward and shallow deformation increasing, eventually culminating in an eruption. The investigative challenge lies in distinguishing these scenarios in real time. Seismologists must pass the fine details of waveforms, detecting whether events are high-frequency brittle quakes or low-frequency long-period signals tied to magma movement. Gas geochemists must monitor for increases in sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide emissions that would betray magma degassing. Geodesists must watch for subtle inflation patterns. Each dataset contributes a piece to the puzzle, but the full picture emerges only when integrated. Ultimately, what the swarm reveals most profoundly is the interconnectedness of Earth's dynamic systems. A rupture in one region, whether hundreds or thousands of kilometres away, can awaken magma bodies, disturb fluids, and trigger quakes in another. The 7.8 earthquake has reminded us that Mount St. Helens remains highly sensitive to tectonic perturbations, a sentinel that will continue to signal the stresses building deep beneath the Cascadia margin. For scientists, this is an opportunity as much as it is a hazard. Each quake in the swarm provides data that sharpen our understanding of how magma systems behave under stress. These insights are not limited to Mount St. Helens, but apply to volcanic systems worldwide, from Japan to Chile to Iceland. By studying how swarms develop, migrate and subside, researchers refine their ability to anticipate which unrest episodes are precursors to eruption and which are not. This knowledge is crucial for hazard assessment and for protecting communities that live in the shadow of active volcanoes. The swarm now unfolding beneath Mount St. Helens is not noise. It is a message written in seismic waves, a story of fluids, melts and rocks negotiating space under pressure. Whether it fades quietly or builds into something greater, it is a reminder that the earth is restless, alive and interconnected in ways we are only beginning to fully map. Each fracture is a word, each quake a sentence, and together they compose the narrative of a volcano forever shaped by both its own magma and the tectonic pulses of the wider planet. And so the questions linger. Is this the stirring of magma long held in check, or merely the sigh of a crust unsettled by distant upheaval? How many times has the earth whispered before it roared, and how many whispers will we recognize in time? What is certain is that Mount St. Helens remains under watch, its seismic pulse now amplified in the wake of the 7.8 earthquake. The swarm is both a scientific opportunity and a sobering reminder of geological risk. As instruments record and researchers analyse, the rest of us are left to witness the unfolding of forces that dwarf human scale, forces that remind us of our fragile place on a shifting planet. If you found this deep dive into the geological processes shaping Mount St. Helens engaging and insightful, do not forget to like, share and subscribe. Tap that notification icon so you never miss the next update as we continue to unravel the mysteries beneath our feet and bring you closer to the heartbeat of the Earth itself.